uh, pediatric eye care, is it? Can I have the care for the pediatric? Yeah, that's fine. So chair, care for the child is important because these kids are going to live, what, 80 years, 90 years? And whenever you do a cataract surgery in an adult patient, say uh, around 60 years, so what, 30 years, 40 years? If you touch just 100. So what you do now is going to be very important because if the kid is blind in the house, the entire family revolves around the child, if, if they are taking care of the child. So one person has to be there always 24-7. So that's why 2020 uh, right to sight people has made this very important. They say if you take care of one child, it's as good as taking care of 10 adults. Okay, so let's see. We have Kaushik Murli. Murli, he hasn't come because uh, uh, Arun is here? Yeah. You are Arun, sorry. I'm sorry. And uh, Jigyasa Sahu, there. she's there. Okay, you want to come up? We have enough seats here. And uh, Gunjan Saluja, please, both of you. Oh, yeah, she's there. And Aditya is, of course, he's there. So we got all the speakers here. Tanmay, Tanmay is here. Tanmay okay. is here. And Anuradha Chandra. She's not there? No. She's not so there. I'll, I'll take her. And uh, Because mine and her are Sam overlapping, Sam so I think I'll use that. Asha Samdani is here. Oh, perfect. Oh. You got two talks. So you're going to talk about the nystagmus and the third nerve palsy. All right, mm -hmm. good. And spectacle, yeah. Siddharth Kesarwani, yeah, he's there, okay, good. And Minakshi, I just saw her there, right, okay, perfect. So I think uh, if we can get the ball rolling, Tanmay. So I think he's going to tell us about the most important thing in the pediatric cataract or refractive or whatever, even for the glasses when you prescribe. The eye is going to grow. In the first six months, Every month, it's 0.6 millimeter growth. That means 0.6 into 6 becomes 3.6 millimeter from day 0 to day 6, uh, six months. So let's see how this, this help you in modifying your IL powers. And uh, Tanmay, all yours, please. Thank you, Dr. Kokhar. So I will be presenting uh, today on uh, biometry of child's eye. So I have no financial interest. So how to do a biometry in a child's eye? So if the child is cooperative enough, you go ahead with the, with the optical method, just preferred because the results are quite consistent. Now the question is, if the child is not cooperative, how to go about it? So you, we do what is known as an on-table biometry along with an examination under anesthesia. So what are the sequences of uh, on-table biometry is first you go ahead with the sedation. Now the agent to be used is I, you, what you usually do is leave it on the anesthetist that is giving the anesthesia, followed by keratometry and uh, followed by IOP with Perkins. Now if we do the IOP with Perkins before the keratometry, then the Myers will come deranged and uh, will give uh, an erroneous readings. So the keratometry, while doing the keratometry, uh, preferably it has to be done without uh, you know the spe speculum so the next is the uh, tube insertion and then the we go ahead with the other examination pass the axial length corneal diameter etc and then we proceed with the rest of the surgery so now the question is what formula The question is, uh, what formula do we use? So we have a lot of lots of formulas. The standard, the, but where we use was the SRK2, SRKT, Holiday 1, Hoffer Q, and the newer generation ones are the Hages, Holiday 2, Olsen, and the Barrett Universal 2. So the standard formula, they were, uh, they have uh, easy to calculate ALPA, have lots of data because they have been used for the lots of, uh, for long duration. And uh, there are various studies that have compared SRK2, SRKT, Hoffer Q, and Holiday 1. So uh, Neely et al. in a study published in 2005, they found that all the four formula did not show any significant difference in their predictive error. But Hoffer Q gave a highly variable results compared to the other three. Now in a study published by Nihalani et al. showed Hoffer Q to be most reliable and NSRK2 to be the least in the population of less than 18 years, where uh, their predictive error was also low compared to the previous study. Whereas that uh, subgroup of less than two years also showed similar results. Kekuni et al. Studied, published a study in uh, 2012 showed SRK to be the most consistent, whereas the Hoffer, Q, Hoffer uh, Q to be the least predictable. Their age group were less than two years and all the formula had more than two diopters of predictive error. 
Vasavar et al. published a study in 2016 concluded that SRK T and Holiday 2 had the least predictive error. Now coming to discussion of the new generation formula, Elbaz et al. Comp- in a post published in 2021 that compared Barrett to SRK T. Hages, Hoffer Q and Holiday 1 found that Barrett 2 was either superior or comparable to the others, whereas SRK T was the least predictable. Nackley et al. in 2019 found that the new generation formulas gives comparable results to standard IOL formulas in pediatric patients, whereas Epley et al. in 2021 found that the Barrett Universal 2 gave the least predictive error ac- across all biometric features and SRK T gave the most amount of errors. So the question is how much to undercorrect? So there are Dahan's formula where uh, they stated the 20% undercorrection for less than 2 years, 10% for 2 to 8 years. Now another is one is the NED's rule of 7, whereas the target refractive error plus the age in years should be around 7. So if the age is 3 years, so the target hyperopia should be plus 4. Now there's a study published in 2019 by Sir, recommended 20% undercorrection for age less than 3 months, 10% for three three months to one year five percent for one to two years two percent in two to five years so the what are the problems or the unique situations that we face in the pediatric eyes so they are the growing eyes so the question is how much do we undercorrect? so um, and another question is whether to hematopoise now or in adulthood well, the consensus is almost all of them uh, almost all of us use undercorrection. amount is varying from surgeon to surgeon Although there are surgeons who prefer to emetropize at the age when they're doing the surgery because they feel uh, hyperopia is more amblyogenic in, uh, than emetropia, so better to emetropize now. So, and also the IOL formulas that we use are usually calibrated for the adult eyes. And also the, measure, the way we measure the axial length and the keratometry in children under anesthesia is not the ideal measuring way that is supposed to be measured. Because when we are using the ultrasound, the the sound should reflect exactly from the fovea. Whereas in uh, children under anesthesia, we are not exactly sure whether it is hitting the fovea. So even a little bit around the fovea will give a lot of errors. So the conclusion is no single formula is conclusively present, pre- proven to be the best. All formulas suffer from various error sources. Younger and younger the patient, higher the sources of the error, and uh, more studies needs to be uh, to establish the accurate pediatric IL formula. So the recommendation is uh, use the IL formula which the surgeon feels gives the most predictable outcome as per his experience. Use of personalized A constants and uh, whenever possible optical measurements of axial length. Thank you. Thank you, Tanmay. That was a very, very precise talk. Um, we have Dr. Koker here, and Sir has done uh, a very recent, very large study on uh, biometry. Uh, so, uh, quick, que- quick, uh, two minutes on, uh, or a, a co- quick comment on uh, biometry. Yeah, sure. See, uh, when we started doing this cataract of 20, 25 years back, we also were following the, the Hans and Pross, uh, and they were doing 20% undercorrection for 10 years, uh, for one, one year and above which we realized that it was causing, hap- leaving haparopia only. And it was, uh, can I start my next uh, set of slides, please? Can somebody can help me here? How do you get out of this? Okay, yeah, got it. So what we did, we took uh, f- uh, subsets of the patients, less than six months, six months to one year, one year to two years and, and above. And each subset, we put implants in these ones and we, we calculated the growth of these patients for one year all these groups. So six months went to one and a half years and subsequently one year went, uh, went to two and a half years. And we realized what is the growth which is happening in our setup. Then we realized that we're doing lots lots of uh, undercorrection. So we reduced the undercorrection. So what we follow for Asian eyes now is, we, we're doing it for the last five, seven years now. If it's a five years, maximum undercorrection do is two person. We don't need more than. Uh, guys at the back, uh, if you're playing games, can you please keep quiet at the end? Thank you. Okay, uh, second is if it's two years old, you do 5% percent undercorrection. all right? You can never have a precise lens. The power comes to 22.75. You don't have a lens of 22.75, so you have to decide whether you go 23 or 22.5. So if the kid is younger, less than t- five years, you go a little less. If it's more than five, you can say emetropic, I can go either way. So more than five years, it doesn't make much difference. 
and there was a study I think in BGO which was published in which they did in six years old they did not do any under correction and they realized that after three years the growth was as good as the normal population so they never found anything there. So the tricky thing is between one year to two years we do 10 percent and less than one year divide into again less than th uh, three months to six months and six months to one year. Okay, six months to one year, it's about 15 percent under correction is good enough in these patients. And less than six months, you have 15 percent, uh, 15 to 20 percent. Less than three months is a tricky business. Now, there the growth is, it happens in spurts. After six months, it grows, uh, slows down. So, in those patients, you can actually, less than three months, if it's bilateral, you can leave them a fake kick and come back again, maybe a six month, one year, whenever they feel comfortable. I'm not saying to wait till five years because most of these FAQ patients, once they lose the set of glasses, they might buy one more pair and that's the end of the story because the, most of the parents will not buy them the third pair, especially the uh, kind of background people are coming. So earlier we were not putting implants in the early uh, younger age group, but then we realized it's not the age of the patient, it's the health of the eye. If your eye size, say, excellent is more than 17 millimeters and white to white cornea is uh, around more than 9, 9.5, uh, maybe 10 millimeter and above, you can easily put implants in these ones. So earlier we were doing this in unilateral cases only. So then we realized what is good for the goose could be good for the gander also. So we started doing for the bilateral cases. And we realized that the glasses and uh, no occlusion treatment required and they did very well. That's why we, we found out our formula. And this formula actually works very well with all the Asian eyes. All right, and you've done a good job. So one quick question. Sure. Um, w what are your thoughts on the, uh, the idea of not undercorrecting them because of good refractive surgery is now available and just concentrating of em on amblyopia therapy yeah. and then later uh, doing a refractive procedure in these cases. Of course you can do that if you can control the growth of the eye. The problem is you can't, nobody can predict what is going to be the growth of the eye. So if they come to myopic say around minus two, three, four, you can do it. But if it goes to 16, 17, 18, mm -hmm. there's going to be a problem. Yes. So I think it's best to kill the thing as you have it. So uh, other thing, what he said is absolutely right. For the patient who can actually come for follow-ups, you can leave them imbitropic if the age is maybe more than two years. Less than two years, we all know the eye is going to grow. So less than two years, I will not agree with him. Between the two to five group, I think I can still go ahead with him and say that you do a less under correction. Say maybe a refractive error should be about water, plus, plus one or plus two, even that's, that's good enough. If you go for myopia or imitropia in less than two, they're going to gallop up very high and that's what doesn't work very well. Okay? okay. And of course the glasses have to be worn with, uh, with this subset okay. also. Once you put an implant under correction, you're done mm -hmm. to the tune of say, if you follow any of these rule. In fact, the Inyadi's rule works pretty well. It's better than the Hans and Pross. So it is very close to what we are actually. We, we got, it, it was almost similar to that. So we can follow the rule of seven and uh, the more uh, very high chances that you will not have a problem in this, this group. Okay? Our next uh, talk is by Dr. Sudarshan Khokhar, sir, who's going to talk on uh, complex situations in pediatric cataract. Yeah, in fact, the next speaker is not here. She's here. And she was supposed to Dr. do the Anuradha. same. So I had kept the talk ready. I thought in case she's not here, I'll cover up. And I think she's ran away. I wanted to check out what she was covering. So I will not cover that in my talk. But since she's not, she not here, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it was not uh, by design. It's by default. I, I didn't push her out anyway, right? Maybe she's gone to get some lunch. Okay, so. You'll have to check if there's. Yeah, I know. Anyway. It goes up with the. How do you proceed these ones, yeah? It, the mouse, okay. So what, this is what a routine surgery looks like, right? So let's see what is a routine. It's a normal eye, you come for the side port, you make three incisions, and you use your Utrata force if you're a beginner, and you then you have to use a heavy viscoelastic, and if you are expert, you can use methyl cellulose also, but then you have to have a smaller openings. Go ahead, do that excess, aspirate the cortex. It's a cakewalk. And do the PCC. Now see, you're using longer forceps. Go ahead, pick it up, rotate all around. And that finishes off. And implants goes into the bag. Okay. So that's what is an ideal. A good size eye, you could calculate the power and you could put, put, do this surgery. Okay, what happens if... These, if there's a change in the size of the eye, it could be a bigger eye, more than 14 millimeter across, or it's less than eight, nine millimeter across. You can have plaques on the anterior caps. I think we'll go along what we do. So if the eyeball is bigger, always ask your uh, cornea, uh, glaucoma colleague to have a look and do a EU in these patients in case there's a half strides and all this, the prognosis as such goes bad. 
and keep an eye on the pressure. Now, these are the patients in which if you want to put a sclerofixated lens, it's a big, big no. I mean, you're gonna get in trouble into these one. If the eye is small, it's a different story altogether. Now, this is a big eye. You can see it's a huge eye. Okay. So, this is the rexus we have, I'm doing here now. And this rexus looks small. It's, it's an illusion because the eye is big, that's why it's looking small. This rexus is about a 5, 5.5 millimeter, which is an ideal size. Cortical aspiration is simple because you have got two openings and these are the MST uh, instruments I've used, no financial interest. Do a posterior capsule rexus. You see the posterior capsule is so lax. You know, overfill, you underfill the bag. You can fill the chamber, but not the bag. If you fill up the bag, the posterior capsule will go further away and it'll run off. Okay, so once the posterior capsule rexus is done, Vitrectomy is already a fluid vitreous because the globe is all big and stretched out. And so which lens, if I put a single piece, it'll be rotating in the eye forever, like a top. So we put a three piece and do a capture. So once you capture this lens, this becomes a part of the bag. Bag and lens becomes one unit. Okay, so it's not gonna move. There won't be any donuses of the lens, no fecal donuses that side. So once that's done, you've done the capture, suture and finish it off. Okay, now situation number two, when the eye is small. Now this is about eight millimeter across. So in all my patients who are in which I'm not going to put an implant, I do the surgery at the same time. Both eyes, I train the tray, I wash in between, and the same GA time and I finish up both. You can do a rexis, you can cut with the cutter, or you can just go with the cutter and eat it up, leave a rim in the periphery. Rim is not strong right now because you cut it, you have not rexed it. But when you visit it again after say six months, one year, it's all fibrous and good for us. Three piece implant in the sulcus, which is an ideal situation. Uh, that's what it looks like. Okay, so if you have a plaque, what do you do in this one? Snow? Okay, so Rexus, we are trying Rexus. Can we reduce these lights so that they can? So that's the entire is a plaque, okay? So the needle can't poke it. The Rexus forceps can't pick it up. A little bit more, less can, it, can you reduce? It? So we had this plasma blade, so we use it. Otherwise, yeah, that's good. You can use a diathermy also, or you can give a nick with a, uh, with a MVR and cut it with the scissors all around. Using all, both the hands, 360 degree, you can actually cut it, no problems. In fact, they stopped making the uh, Fugo blade now, so you won't have access to that. In, in fact, ours is also not working. So, and once you've done the aspiration, surgery over, and this is what it looks like at the end. So, that's what it looks like at the end. And this margin is not gonna run away because it's already thick fibrous. The fibrous is holding it down, actually. Okay, now this is a second situation. There's a, there's a plaque in the middle. Whenever time gets up, you stop me. These are videos only and we can run it later, no problem. I want everybody to have a talk. So you see, I'm using it, pulling it inwards. So you have to use your, all the dynamics and physics which you know from the school days to make sure that it doesn't run off. Do not be aggressive and pull it in one go, otherwise this is gonna go haywire all over the place and that's what it looks at the end. Now this is half is clear and the other half is not clear. So you start doing a rexis there and this, this bit and the other one you can cut with the rexis. And you using the scissors, you're going and cutting it and once this is done, this is what is going to look at the end of the surgery. I, I think I'll forward it, my time might run off. So that's what you can see, the plaque is here and the other part is there. Now this is a dear posterior capsule stuck together. You can't pick it up. If you try to lift it up, you're gonna break those onules. So what you do is take an MVR, go all the way through at one position, and then with the scissor, this is what you could have done in the first case also, which I was trying to do with a few go blades. So you don't have to buy the few go. Okay, so I've cut it around, and this has a good support for the lens. You can put a three-piece lens, all right. And all my colleagues, friends in US and, and the UK, this is what they do. If there's a plaque at the back, they put the implant first and they go and cut it later on. I mean, that can also be done. There's so many ways you can skin the cat, so whatever works best in your hand is what you should do, okay. Okay, so what happens if you have a unilateral PFB? No, have you seen this video before? No, that's the blood flow which is there in that. That means it's arterial blood and if you touch it without uh, diathermizing it, it's gonna bleed like hell. And this is what you can have ooze there. So this one we published about, I think 10 years back in which we, we realized that we can use a plasma blade. We had a plasma blade. But right now, even if you don't have plasma blade, you can use a diathermy. Diathermy is available with any of the basic FECO machine, every machine has a diathermy. So whenever you buy a machine, please pick up a diathermy probe along with that, which you might be using them in, in this situation, especially when there's a vascular thing. You cut it. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. Is the second talk going on? Uh, 
Yeah, okay, thank you. This guy got a good hairstyle, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we do. Okay, so no, that was plasma. This is diathermy. So you can use a diathermy to the same effect. Okay. Uh, make sure, and that's the, that's a sign. If you see, there's a, a pinky shoe which is happening here now. That is called a salmon patch sign, which we described. So when the lens is intact, the blood flow is not happening. A moment you take the cortex out, and the incision is there. The lens chamber goes shallow these vessels start oozing. So the ones which are oozing are the ones which will have bleed later on. So these are the one in which you have to diathermy. You see, I'm making the tip of the red uh, stalk, make it white with the diathermy, and then cut it. You can let it go retract, because most of the time the vitreous is fluid at the back, so it's not good. You don't have to cut it all the way down to the, the disc. In fact, all my retina colleagues, they keep sending the patients to me, because if there's no detachment, they have nothing to do. What's the point in making three port going behind and doing nothing? So they're all sending the patients to us only, so we're handling it. So this is what we published earlier. So if there's a posterior capsule defect, you should be smart enough to pick it up and be ready with it. So now this one is a rarefied cataract. You know, that's the cataract, this part is clearer. So these are the dots. So that's what is a typical uh, uh, fishtail sign. So fishtail, because there's an opening at the posterior, so these lens fibers go, uh, better goes back and causes reaction, the liquefaction of the cortex at the back. Vitreous, so it moves. Hmm? So I've done a rexis. Now if your posterior capsule is not good, your anterior rexis has to be good. So if you are scared, make it up a five millimeter, make it four millimeter, but please do not have a bad anterior exit, otherwise the lens positioning is gonna be bad. So in this technique, if you see these white, so light, white dot signs, that means the vitreous is actually uh, is involved. So that's the, these white dot signs tells you there's a posterior opening in, in these patients. And I'm eating up the, uh, of the uh, vitreous right now, eating up the vitreous cutter. And now I'm leaving a little fringe here and fringe here of the vitreous, and that's anterior capsule, posterior capsule. Now, if you have this kind of position, you can actually put a single piece in the bag, okay? Otherwise, a three piece in the sulcus is an answer in these patients, okay? Why is dropped? The system is, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. So a single piece going in, and single piece lens has to be put in the bag. You don't have to put the lens on the posterior capsule. When the lens goes inside, make it go up like a nose of the airport. When the airport aircraft is coming down, nose down, it never touches the nose. The nose goes up. So similarly, the lens has to go up into the into the bag. So the hind wheel should touch first, and this is how it looks at the end. And this patient has been followed for a few years now without any problem. Okay. So other thing is persistent pupillary membrane. Should you operate or not? See this patient. Now this is case number one. So if you have this patient. There's a, there's a deprivation in this patient because the light is not going inside. What you need to do is you have to be careful. The lens might be clear. So helon in the eye and using a blunt instrument, I'm using a Sinsky. I'm just holding the fibrils which are going from collet to collet and I'm lifting them up. I'm not pushing them down, I'm lifting them up. And once I get this one, I use a forceps and pull it up into the, into the anterior chamber, all right? So once you've done this much, if you think the lens is good, you can leave it alone. There's nothing which is better than a God-created lens which is accommodating. And if it's a clear lens, for God's sake, don't do anything. You've got a good opening, you take the viscoelastic out, and that's the end of the story. Okay. Whereas if, the, if you have a cataract in these patients, you can plan that one, and you can go with the cataract surgery along with that. Now, same thing. In each patient, I'll go like that. I will not touch the lens till I have to touch the lens. So wherever the weak zone, I pick it up, and these are going from call rate to call rate. So they're coming from edge to edge. So you can pick it up from anywhere over the iris also. And then you hold it and just keep picking it up and keep breaking it off. Okay? And this patient had a cataract. So once we saw the cataract there, so you have to you have to take this uh, seriously. So if you can do a UBM in these patients preoperative, if you know there's a cataract, you can actually go straight away and do it. Now, this is what the patient at the end looks like. The same patient with a persistent pupillary memory in the front which are the cataract. Of course, the pupil is not going to be round. It will have some tags here and there, but that's fine. I mean, if you put this patient in atropine for a, a couple of weeks and the pupil will stay a little dilated and see how it's going out now. So then you do the PCC, which I already explained, and the lens can go into the back. Okay. All right. So what do you do in this patient now? Okay. All right. Any takes? Oh, let's, sorry. No, 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 no. Are you? What's happening here? I know, but what's good? I don't play. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also done the same. You did the same thing which I did. Yeah, yeah. But you have to just break this one. Yeah. Okay. So what do you do here? 
is a non-aid patient. You want to do something? You want to send it to the cornea colleague? They, nobody going to touch this because there's no bag, there's no chamber in this one. So what we did in this one of these patients was we went from the anterior root only under the iris because it's all stuck, there's no space, you can't separate them. All the way under the lens or under the iris onto the lens, okay? So I got two openings now. So I can put my irrigation and a cutter. It has to be a cutter game. You can't do anything else in this one. So similar to what we do for a, a smaller eye surgeries with a cutter probe in and out entire surgery over in five minutes. So I'm eating the anterior capsule, I've eaten up and open the iris also. There's no point in not leaving the pupil behind because they'll get stuck and give you trouble later on. And these patients will have, now this is about a 5.2 and we put a foldable lens. We, it's not folding very well, so it's rigid, almost going like a rigid lens. Sorry, it was a 3.5 incision. And the lens goes into the bag. I have not opened the posterior capsule. If I had opened the posterior capsule, this lens would have gone into the vitreous, right? So if I leave the posterior capsule intact, I'll get in trouble. So now after the implant and the haptic opens up, I'll go under that and I cut it out. And now this is what it looks like. The patient had 618 vision till the last follow-up, but you're, you're lucky it got away. I mean, it won't happen in all the patient, but the buck has to stop somewhere because patient we get are the ones which are referred from at 10, 15 places. Nobody wants to touch this patient. So you can give it a try with a with the explained progress to the patients. Okay, subluxation are the ones which are bad. You can go up and down, in and out. So UBM is what you see, lens in the front, lens in the back. The, at a different time when you do UBM, you might find the lens in the front or find at the back. So these are the ones in which, okay, so this was a surgery which we, I performed at uh, Westmead Hospital in Sydney. So this was the lens they threw at me. So this is a spherophakia in the anterior chamber. Now I would have done a lensectomy straight away in two minutes and I put an iris claw in this one got away with it. Okay, I think the Goras will always throw some challenge at you, but when you pass that, then they become your fan. So once you do a Rexis, your work is done. Then they, I have not used the, these, uh, these instruments ever before, what they had. So they gave me this uh, Morsher's ring, which is a big, big ring. So you see what happens when I put the ring in. I think I'll stop after this video. So the Morsher ring is gonna overlap on each other. So there was nothing for the pediatric eye. This is a huge ring and you see how much of the overlap? It's already overlapping here. See that? And once the moisture goes in, then you can actually push it back behind the iris. We published a paper like that about 15 years back and the patient came back with lens and everything into the vitreous, we have to take it out. So till you suture it to the scleral, I think somebody was asking me the scleral suture for this one. So scleral sutures can be done, now I did in this patient. So and this was, uh, and then you put in, uh, I was not sure that I'll be able to manage to reach this uh, position. So that's why I didn't make the scleral flaps earlier. Now, when I plan these, we always make a scleral flap before when the eye is still firm. So once the scleral flaps are there, you can push the needle inside. And I put a CTS, it's a segment. It's like a, it's like a uh, uh, hanger on which you put a coat. So it's very simple, it goes in and you can suture it up. And now that's what you have. You have an entire bag and the lens, Single piece, three piece, multi, whatever want you want, with any lens can go into the bag and it'll stay because there's a suture there. My plan was to put the other suture also, but they, they were happy with one, so I left it. The patient had six, nine vision on the day one. Okay, so this was what without a CTR and this is the one which we, I just shown you. And this is one last one and then we finished off. Now this is, has to be done because the lens is actually in the anterior chamber. It's eating up the endothelial cells. See that? So I'm going all the way inside. I think I'll go forward on this. Aditya, last one, sorry. Oh, this is, she must be doing, taking more time. It's her talk, now. Mine is over earlier. I was on time. So, see, I'm eating it up. Now I'm gonna show you one thing. I'm gonna hold this bag. I gotta take it out. I, I preserve this bag. So I hold the bag and pull it. So see where I'm pulling it from the iris, there's a ooze there, okay? That means it's stuck onto the iris. And then it's a fake kick now. And you can do a, whatever you want. In this patient, we put iris claw and that's it. I'm not gonna show you that. So I'm done with that and I think, and this is a book which you, in fact, download. I think it's available free on the site, so, and you can pick up all the surgery from there, and, and that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank I you can so ask. much, sir, for that beautiful display of all the different cases. Uh, I'm sure uh, we have some questions from the panel.
Um, I have one uh, question, sure. sir. You had these uh, fibrous plaques uh, that you showed where yeah. you went all around it. Uh, but what if the plaque is like covering the entire anti capsule? Would you think of a vitrorexis in those situations, or would you again uh, because we don't have the the fugo blade or the? No, no, no. What I has told you: take a MVR, make a stab incision. Asha, you can uh, come to the stage. You're next. You're next. So you make a stab and put your scissors. You got two openings: one 80 degree across. You can go cutting all. What one half here, one quadrant here, then chain the hands and cut it. I think that works the best because most of the time, if it's a fibrous plaque, the cutter will not work in these ones. And it'll then, as Dr. Jagatra was saying, you have to change the parameters of machine and it still might not work. Mm -hmm. So, when you get frustrated, you can cause more complication. If the cutter rotates downwards, you can open the pussy capsule and things like that. So, let's use a scissors, and scissors, I think, they work very well in these ones. So, all the pediatric cataract surgeons should know one a good vitrectomy, how to do. On these machines which you have, not, you don't need a vitrectomy machine, you can use your FICO machines. You should use how, know how to use your forceps and scissors. So you, when you get noodles, you can eat with the fork or you can use the chopsticks. So please get used to chopsticks if you're doing the pediatric age group, right? And you have to know how this long forceps, because handling a long forcep and short forcep is a, it's a different ball game altogether because the fulcrum changes, your dynamics changes. So you have to go very slow with the longer forceps and it doesn't have a bend. So you have to make sure that the eye rotates a bit, whereas uh, Uttarata forceps is a cakewalk. So you can do that way. And so in these microphthalmic cases, yeah. uh, the pupil doesn't dilate at all. Mm. So uh, do you, you have an expander you use or do you just... See, if there's a small eye in which I'm not going to put an implant, uh, eye is 8 millimeter. I actually eat the rough, I eat the pupillary rough in this one. And I leave the, always leave a rim at the back in case the eye grows up. Mm. In fact, the peripheral rim actually work, helps in, in so many ways. The, the, the donuses of the iris is less. So I'll request everybody who get this patient, if you're not able to put an implant, please leave a rim in these patients and eat up the central 4 to 5 millimeter. That's your zone. You can eat, what, do whatever you want to do in 4 to 5 millimeter. Please don't go beyond that. If, even if you eat it in one quadrant, it, one side, it's fine. Draw a diagram so that next time whoever opens this eye knows this is an area which is clear. So you can put a secondary implant. And the last question, sir, is how many times, how many of these uh, difficult situations are you locking the lens or, or capturing it in the posterior capsule? And how's it been like? Yeah, okay. So I think that's a very good question, especially people are doing it. You're all doing pediatric cataracts, I believe. Okay. So three-piece lens is the one which is the most forgiving lens. Your anterior axis or posterior axis, either of them is not good. You can put a three-piece lens. Put in the sulcus, capture with anterior capsule or posterior capsule or both. Okay. Uh, there's a technique called bag in the lens, which uh, Mary Tassigan has started. So what you can do is, if you in your routine surgery also, if you can put your haptics in the sulcus, an optic goes behind the posterior capsule. Then your anterior posterior capsule gets chances to you know, uh, uh, fuse with each other. It's as good as a bag in the lens, except at two places where the haptics are actually not allowing it to fuse. So it works perfectly well. So he, all these patients in which there's a anterior or posterior axis, which is not good, I'll always go for a three-piece lens. Or my rex is big. If rex is goes six millimeter, there's a plaque and I'm doing it and it's, it's become six or eight millimeter. Then a three-piece lens with the capture, we're doing routinely in all the patients now. In, in fact, my SRs are all doing a uh, great job, I think, doing the same. Dr. Lela from Trivandrum. Okay, so even for the single piece I do with trachme, the reason is that we are putting adult lenses in smaller. All these bags, we just published a work in which we did a biometry uh, on a size measurement on UBM. Uh, there was a thesis which finished about a couple of years back. We realized these bags are not as big as adult bags. So our bag size maximum was 8.5 to 9 millimeter and you're putting lenses which are 12.5. So if you don't do the vitrectomy, the space is not there. So vitrectomy has to be done for all these kids in which you do the posterior capsule. The set which talks about three-piece lenses capturing behind without doing a vitrectomy, we'll have to follow those patients and see how they're faring in the long run because single piece in the bag, you need to have a, a good vitrectomy. Again, that can act as a scaffold for the cells to exactly. deposit it on the Exactly, exactly. Some recent studies, some comparative studies between the two eyes have been done. Yeah, I know, I know. But we have to follow these ones. I know I've done in few patients, then I realize if, if the kid is small, so six months, it becomes difficult for people to handle. So it should be a technique which is good and simple. So everybody can adapt to that. Uh, Rexes, I think, posterior, everybody has become uh, good on that. But you have to do a trick me, this one. As he said rightly, the scaffold goes away and the lens is in the bag. Tomorrow, if you want to change the lens for some power reason, the ones which you captured behind, I think the entire bag might come out. So that's another thing which I'm not very happy with in that study. So I've written a queries to them, but they have not responded. 
Right. In the smaller eyes, yeah. have you ever thought of putting a smaller lens to overall diameter? Okay, so I talked to all these companies to provide smaller lenses. Even in Australia, I wanted. Nobody is making smaller lenses because it's not fruitful for the company. Because they have these fixed uh, dias in which they put the lenses, they're not going to make the lenses for you. Until unless you make a policy decision, nobody has small lenses. Only smaller lenses are the one mm. which you have an iris claw, which I think everybody, there's a group in Chennai who's making one, and uh, the Jeet Singh's group, they're making smaller lenses. They're making six millimeter across with a four millimeter uh, optic. But then those are to the iris claw lenses. And uh, yes, those lenses are available, and we're using few patients. But us in the back, at the most physiological position, you don't have lenses, smaller lenses. We don't have. You can't cut the haptics and make them smaller. It won't work. No. No. PMM. Yeah, but what is the overall diameter? Overall goes higher. So that's what I'm saying. So all are 12, 12, 12 to 13 is what we have. Most of them are 12.5. So the bag will get stretched. So uh, that's what we are talking about. Optic you can change. But the, if the haptic, we talk about the haptic size, you talk about the overall size, right? No, those lenses are not available. No, nowhere in the world. I think uh, yeah, we'll go to the next talk. Ahead, yeah. uh, next talk is by Dr. Asha Samdani, and she's going to talk on approach to nystagmus. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir, for such an enlightening talk. It was very good to hear you talk again. Listen to you, I'm sure that one is better than mine. No, sir. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Asha, and I'll be talking about nystagmus. Uh, so the nystagmus, there is a slow phase and a corrective uh, fast phase and this is the VNG of the pendular nystagmus and this is the CMAS classification of nystagmus. Here we are going to talk only about INS, FMNS and SNS. Uh, so this is the infantile nystagmus syndrome. Uh, we can see as the name suggests this is infantile onset and uh, when we uh, occlude the fixating eye, there is no change of the head turn. That suggests it's a gaze null and not an adduction null. And we can see there is a null point where the intensity of the nystagmus has reduced. So that uh, explains why he had a right turn. So there is a head posture which is uh, mostly evident at the age of four years. So head posture development, the nystagmus is less in levo version because of which the patient has acquired a right face turn. So here he is a six year old male. Uh, there is a right face turn with the uh, nystagmus in both eyes since birth. Uh, even the preferred, in the preferred case, that is the right face turn, his visual acuity is better both binocularly as well as uniocularly. In the primary case, it's only 612. So he has maintained a 30 degrees right face turn. So here uh, he is the uh, diagnosis is manifest nystagmus with a null in 30 degrees levo version. We have done an augmented Anderson procedure, right eye MR recession of 9 mm and left eye LR recession of 12 mm. Here is the post-op video of the patient. Here we can see that there is no face turn and there is no squint which is induced and the, uh, there is, uh, the null position is in the primary gaze now. So the key points from this case, we have to rule out PAN and also MLN before going ahead for the surgery. This is the case too. It's almost similar to the previous case, uh, but uh, she is a case of uh, oculocutaneous albinism with nystagmus since birth. She has a left face turn here and the visual acuity is also better in the left face turn. She has a 20 degrees face turn and she also has an associated squint of 14 prism diopters. So here it is the manifest nystagmus on occlusion of the fixing eye. There is no change of the head turn that suggests it's a gaze null. We have done an augmented Anderson procedure for this uh, nystagmus here and a squint surgery for the associated squint. Instead of 9 mm, we have done a 10 mm of uh, MR recession for the squint. Here we can see the post-op. Uh, there is no face turn now and there is no squint. So this is the pre-op and this is the post-op. So here comes the manifest latent nystagmus. It is again infantile in onset. It's bilateral, conjugate. Uh, on uh, occlusion of the fixing eye, there is a change in the head turn as we can see here to take up the other eye in the adduction. So the patient prefers an adduction. That means it's an adduction null. So again here we can see that the visual acuity is better binocularly and even uniocularly the visual acuities are always better in the adduction of the eye. That suggests that the patient is a manifest latent nystagmus 
and also with the adduction null. Here we can see that there is a squint of almost 5 to 10 degrees in the left eye and uh, there is a 30 degrees of face, right face turn. So the diagnosis is LCS with manifestation nystagmus with an adduction null. We have done both eyes MR posterior fixation at 14 mm from the limbus for the adduction null component and right eye MR recession of 4 mm for the squint. So here is the post-op video of the same patient. There is no face turn here and there is no squint. Uh, before going ahead for the surgery, we can even do a prism adaptation test with uh, seven base out prisms in each eye to see if the uh, head posture can be corrected. This is an artificial divergence surgery. So uh, summing up, if there is an eccentric null in adduction and there is a coexisting esotropia, we have to do an MR recession of dominant eye. If it's an exotropia, MR recession with the dominant eye for the nystagmus and R and R for the other eye for the squint. We have already talked how to differentiate manifest and manifest latent, so I'm skipping this slide. This is a nystagmus blockage syndrome. There is an inverse relation of esotropia and nystagmus. So more the esotropia, the uh, intensity of nystagmus is less. Spasmus Newton's is a uh, uh, nystagmus seen with a triad of binocular pendular nystagmus, head nodding and head posture. So here we can see that the nystagmus is disconjugate, it's asymmetric in the right and left eye, it's dissociated and it's also multiplanar. The important thing in this is we have to consider neuroimaging because they can be associated with chiasmal lesions. Uh, this is a pan uh, periodic alternating nystagmus. Observing the patient for at least five yeah. minutes is very yeah, important yeah, as uh, the treatment sure plan can be uh, different in which bilateral augmented Anderson procedure needs to be done. So the management, non-surgical counseling and surgical, I'm going to skip the non-surgical uh, and going to come here to the surgery. Yeah, so the surgery, our main principle is to shift the null to the primary position and increasing the foveation time by artificial divergence as we have seen before and MR recession or fatten should be done for that. And there is the evolution of nystagmus surgeries from Kestenbaum, Sparks, Anderson's, modified Kestenbaum for more uh, head turn like 30 degrees and 45 degrees. And this is an augmented Anderson procedure with pre-op face turn and post-op there is no face turn. This is MR Fadin for adduction null and I'm going to finish it in one slide. This is a anomalous head position with chin down position, bilateral SR recession has been done. Yeah. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and I would like to acknowledge my seniors. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Um, we can have a quick comment by the panel before we ask Dr. Siddharth Keswani, uh, sir, to come. Uh, she'll do her last talk later on spectacle prescriptions in children. It's giving more time at the fovea, oh as yes. you said, fovea, it improves, that's why they have a result. But the nystagmus will not disappear totally, ever. <laughs> yeah, regarding your, you know, the first question, like when the, you are planning for, like, uh, augmented, you know, the anderson keston bomb and there is a squint. So usually to tackle that, you can always do, you know, the fixating eye surgery, R and R, depending upon whether it is XT or, you know, there is ET, and that will take care of even by doing one eye surgery, you would take care of both the squint as well as, you know, the AHP. Yeah, and, uh, and the other eye you can do for the nystagmus later on, maybe. Yes, I think that's, that's a great idea. So people do it uh, stage-wise also. So you would get Ma good Ma'am, regarding the Delos procedure, for how long is it effective? Long-term follow-up? Uh, yes, three days. Oh. Because that's three the question. Uh, yeah. My experience is similar to Madam's. Uh, I don't see any change. But the patient is very happy. <laughs> I, don't I think because you've done the surgery, you charge the patient to feel happy. But I think if you do the ENG in these patients, you realize that the, the amplitude goes down and there's more of a foveolization. It stays on the fovea for longer It's a period. placebo That's effect. I, I, I it's again, a surgical because placebo Because there's no effect. access to probably a nystagmography. I know. But I think a lot of it is probably a placebo effect. We have done something, they spend money, they have to feel good. <laughs> That's what I said first. But I think most of the centers should have because what happens if you send it for publication, they are not, not going to accept it. I understand. It. That's Without ENG, they are not going to. So that's why the Westerners have an edge on us because they have these equipments in place. True. So which is so, a solid state because the equipments are expensive. They're very expensive equipments. And uh, I think that's what a country is. So maybe, I mean, keep doing the work and let's hope for the best, right? Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, six minutes too short for this topic, so I'll just dive into it. Uh, first, categorize the type. 
okay because it's not like an adult who will tell you your uh, you know the vision and then you do the refraction and give the glasses very simple in adults in 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 children you first categorize whether it's an infant or toddler or preschool child or a school age child and then you have to do this risk benefit analysis for every child so as you go about it you will start doing it faster and faster in your mind what are the risks we simply give the glasses what's the problem with it whatever the refractive error may be the child is going to see better so why do you even think that we, we, when you should prescribe and when you should not prescribe because when he is growing up <coughs> he has to be very mobile and active so it can come uh, in the way of play activities it reduces the field of vision a little bit there is some emotional stigma attached to it because the peers will tease the parents will look at the child in a different way and may it may also interfere with the process of emetropization so if he has got a physiological refractive error and we are correcting it then it might just stop the uh, you know improvement of the eye to emetropization and the benefit is very obvious you know the child will see better and his performance will improve he will have a better binocular interaction and it will prevent amblyopia so this risk benefit whether whether giving the glass is actually going to make the child's life better is what you need to ask in every single case <coughs> the decision making will depend upon these factors uh, or the mi- magnitude of refractive error how big is the refractive error whether this there is an Im- uh, any other amblyogenic risk factor associated with that refractive error per se if there is a, f- a family history of uh, amblyopia or whether there is a, uh, 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 a, a anything that will uh, change the cut off that you are giving the visual need the visual symptoms and the visual function so if the child is not doing the task that children of his age are able to do then probably that is a symptom enough for you to give glasses and whether what he is expected to do so nowadays the things are changing because earlier the children were going to school a little later now they are going pretty early plus their visual needs have gone up so the older guidelines we are supposed to you know somehow modify depending on the child's activities so when you are taking history try and find out what kind of uh, daily routine the child has whether he goes to a formal school and all and then find out whether this giving this glass is actually going to help him to his daily activities and whether he has any other developmental delay or developmental issues where the accommodation itself may be problematic then those cases also you might have to think about giving glasses at a lower threshold plus if the child has got any binocular vision anomalies like squint or nystagmus or abnormal head posture then you might want to give a trial of glasses to see whether it is helping the child improve so first when you start giving glasses to children you first need to understand what is normal so children are not born normal they are not 6 by 6 at birth and their eyeball is not uh, you know the refractive error is not zero so at birth the refractive error is a very wide range sometimes from plus ticks to you know minus 3 minus 4 anything it can be and as this graph shows the progression of refractive error over the first 4 years of life you can see the mean is around plus 2 when they are born and then gradually decreases and uh, the the uh, the curve becomes narrower and narrower so uh, you need to understand what is the amblyogenic potential so if myopia is more than 7 to 8 diopters uh if the aniso myopia is more than 2 2 and a half to 3 diopters if hypermetropia is 4 to 5 diopters or aniso hyperopia is 1 to 1 and a half diopters similarly if astigmatism is more than 2.5 diopters and aniso metropia in astigmatism is 1.5 diopters then these are potentially amblyogenic for the child now child may get amblyopia even at lower thresholds but these are usually the universally accepted cutoffs and uh, risk of amblyopia is b- only there before 6 years of age so if by the time the child has reached 6 years and he is not yet developed amblyopia because of his refractive error then it is very unlikely he will develop in the future so let's c- see how hyperopia is corrected we, because the amplitude of accommodation is very high in children you usually undercorrect children you undercorrect children uh, uh, who who have severe hyperopia and low hyperopia should not be corrected low hyperopia is 0 to 2 moderate is 2 to 4 and 4 to uh, 4 and above is high hyperopia so you don't correct them so 2 to 4 is something which is the gray area where different people follow different things so like in this table there was a study between optometrist and md's who prescribes when so the optometrist had a much lower threshold of prescribing in the moderate hyperopes whereas the opto- ophthalmologist had a higher threshold in different age groups now for for the uh, for the audience just just spend 30 seconds on this chart this is a very very easy chart to remember this is probably the you know sum total of all the charts 
so <coughs> you dis uh, uh, you know uh, divide them into infant toddler preschool and school going and uh, the the refractive error on one side so it's 4321 for myopia it is 4.5 3.5 2.5 and 1.5 for hypermetropia for astigmatism it is 2.5 2 1.5 and 1 uh, it's very simple to remember so what age group what is the cutoff if somebody is above that you give it for anisometropia if the age is less than one year if the anisometropia is more than three diopters then you can probably wait because sometimes it equalizes uh, if even after one year of age then you follow that uh, if the anisomyopia is more than two diopter and astigmatism is 1.5 diopter and anisohyperopia is one diopter then you can prescribe because then that difference is amblyogenic uh, for very high myopes, unilateral myopes, you can give full prescription. This is one of the common mistakes I see. People try to undercorrect them. So if somebody is minus 10 in one eye and it is axial, usually uh, you can give full correction. You will have to lower the cutoff in cases of developmental delay in presence of squint, nystagmus, and a family history of amblyopia. Thank you very much. I think I've run out of Thank time. You. There were cases. But we Thank you, Siddharth, for yeah. the Thank wonderful you. presentation Thank in the shortest possible time. <laughs> And uh, now will be a greater challenge. Dr. Meenakshi is coming here and uh, she'll be discussing about complicated establishment situation management pearls in six minutes. I really wonder how she'll be able to. <laughs> it's a complicated <laughs> situation. It's really man. complicated. All the best, Dr. Meenakshi. <laughs> I think there's lots of overlap in the program. I think could have been better designed, actually. So in other words, I'm saying it's not my program, so I haven't designed it. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Kokar and uh, AOC committee for giving me this opportunity. I will try to be as short as possible because it is six minutes. I will just take an... Which is the next slide? This one is the next slide. Okay. It's not working. Can I go here? Um, I, will, I have taken five case scenarios. So the first one is a three-year-old child who presented to us with inward deviation of the eyes for 10 months. There was no contributory, uh, this thing. But uh, there was a high hypermetropia, plus seven at two cylinder, and a reduction deviation from uh, 45 to 35 prism with a normal or hypermetropic discs. But uh, something was amiss. Uh, we were following up the case. But why this is not? No, this is going straight to the... Mm. Okay, on the lump, uh, we thought it is a partially accommodative isotropia. It had come on the sixth month follow-up also. And at 11th month follow-up, uh, the child had uh, headache and there was not much reduction in the uh, hypermetropia. We thought probably the child is not using glasses, but we saw disc edema. So we went ahead with the neuroimaging, which re uh, revealed a medulloblastoma. And the child underwent uh, suboximetal craniectomy with gross total resection of mass and uh, after ruling out metastasis. And now the after surgery, the child is uh, eye is straight with glasses. So it was not a, a partial accommodative isotropia. And uh, what was the red flag? The spectacle induced error in measurement of deviation we should have in mind in high hyperopic glasses. The spectacles induce a base out effect causing an apparent reduction in the measured deviation, which goes by this formula. And if we had used it, and uh, it would have shown that what we measured as 35 was probably the same 45. And uh, the reduction in deviation was just an error induced by the higher powered uh, spectacle uh, lenses, so it could not be a refractive ESO. And there was no near uh, distance disparity, so it, uh, it cannot be a non-refractive accommodative. And any sudden onset ESO at three years of age, better to do a baseline uh, 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 MRI. So never assume anything just because it is there is hypertropia, uh, hypermetropia and uh, uh, ESO deviation. So be thorough. And we went ahead and published it also. And uh, uh, this is the second case, a 17 year old girl with uh, esotropia and large angle and a dense amblyopia. And she, we didn't want to obviously touch the uh, right eye. So conventional options are hang back, hemi hang back, large recessions, all that. But what is the disadvantage? It is tendency to creep forward. And uh, we cannot think of uh, gross incompetency it can cause or loss of motility also. And what about sutures and expanders? Works well for browns, but not for uh, medial rectus muscles because it can get extruded or infected. 
so video is not playing no so we did a, a muscle uh, transplantation uh, which uh, dr jitani has uh, published also so same way you just go uh, uh, for uh, take the medial rectus as in a recession you go and uh, hook the muscle but you use a non absorbable suture of uh, ethy bond suture uh, before uh, for uh, at the original insertion site before disinserting so that uh, we will have the uh, for attaching the uh, resected muscle uh, we use this suture to the resected muscle and uh, now we go back do not do anything then go back and uh, uh, go to the lateral rectus here uh, the regular way uh, you can uh, uh, go and uh, where you measure uh, uh, you place the 6 o vicral sutures at the original resected site as well as here in the uh, uh, insertion site then disinsert the muscle and then go and attach it to the uh, insertion as in a regular uh, uh, resection the only thing is we have to what we do is just simply cut instead of that we have placed the suture there so we have the excess muscle now and then this you go and attach to the uh, medial rectus where we have recessed so this gives an additional 5 millimeters but uh, final attachment is only with the uh, 6 o vicryl only the uh, uh, resected extra bit muscle is we are where we are using the uh, ethy bond suture so the rest is the same so this is the final outcome so uh, the long term results have shown good uh, this thing we have done around four cases of uh, muscle transplant and we have got good results uh, the third case is uh, eight year old girl comes with a left face turn and uh, you can see the uh, left uh, down shoot so we should not think it is a superior oblique overaction it is just a uh, drs with a down shoot as you can see here the left face turn the down shoot in adduction and the reduction in the palpebral fissure so it was just a type 1 duance because of the uh, lateral rectus uh, getting this thing so this was our pre-op and uh, post-op where we had done a medial rectus recession with a large y split i mean uh, with uh, 20 millimeters uh, in between and we did that when uh, this was the post-op picture you can see there's no down shoot so totally you should uh, see the this thing this was the fourth case where the patient had come with uh, med severe ptosis with poor lps and a right hypertrophy of 50, 50 prisms and ftt was positive and uh, no marcus gun jaw winking phenomenon and uh, this case uh, this is a classical thing where we do a uh, inferior rectus recession with uh, a nap or a modified nap instead of that we did the modified nishidas and uh, we did a uh, inferior rectus recession with the modified nishidas and this is what we got the result as uh, straight eyes immediate post op so always try to avoid anterior segment ischemia as much as possible and bank on something that is which is always reversible the final one can i have sir yeah yeah sure please go so this was a 73 year old uh, lady referred with progressive inward deviation of the eyes of uh, 4 months duration and uh, she had undergone cataract surgery uh, uh, 15 years back and uh, history of squint surgery in the left eye 25 years back her axial length was uh, 32 and uh, 26.19 this was given by uh, dr sandra of uh, Coimtur, this uh, this thing so what is this uh, differentials we can think of uh, long standing lateral rectus or this thing but it is a uh, heavy eye syndrome and uh, we can see the uh, imaging we can see the uh, nasal displacement of both the uh, superior rectus as well as the uh, lateral rectus and the measurement of the dislocation angle you can see in the right eye is around 225 and left it is around 230 so we did uh, dr sandra had shared this video with me thank you to thanks to sandra and uh, this is a yokoyama procedure which gives the but first we have to do the medial rectus because it was uh, tight so that was uh, done first so this is so this is the Okayama and the only advantage here is main advantage is uh, 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 it is much more simpler you are not uh, uh, disinserting or anything and uh, and you just have to do a loop myopexy go around 10 millimeters behind and then uh, go and uh, use a non absorbable suture and uh, you get it placed. 
so muscles sclera muscles but one thing we are all have to be very careful is uh, about the scleral thing so so this is the uh, post op day one patient was uh, happy so to summarize a thorough assessment is mandatory in all cases always use all the techniques available in the surgical armamentarium and a single a sign can have multiple differentials and follow time tested strategies and each patient needs a customized search. thank you thank you so much ma'am there was a very very uh, precise talk that you've given us uh, on a very difficult uh, topic our last talk for the day is by dr asha samdani she's going to talk about uh, management of third nerve palsy before we give the uh, yeah the floor to the next session please asha just uh, take couple of minutes and just you know just sum it up straight away yeah, right has the chairman for the next session come yet yes. oh he's there sorry i didn't see you okay so i'll be talking about third nerve palsy <coughs> so i'm going to skip all the anatomy and codes I think everybody knows anatomy. You can't do these surgeries without anatomy. P perfect. Yeah. So uh, I'll just talk about this pupil sparing cases. Uh, in this, we have to investigate for the ischemic causes like hypertension, diabetes, CAD, and also the important thing is we have to observe for five days for any delayed involvement and recheck again after every four to six weeks. And when you should consider an imaging in pupil sparing cases is when the patient is less than 50 years, incomplete palsy, and children less than 10 years, aberrant regeneration, and if it doesn't improve, as it generally does in three months. And evaluation of the case. This is all. This also I'm going to skip. I'm going to come right away to the case. So she is a young female who has got an RTA like six months back, and on examining there is a 45 degrees of uh, her uh, exo, and also high hypo. So uh, and FDT for LR is free, and MR has a weak so weak force. So this is a patient of right eye post traumatic complete third nerve palsy with pupillary involvement and with an aberrant regeneration. So we have done an left eye LR to MR transposition surgery, and she the uh, exo is beautifully corrected here. So again, this is a case presentation. Uh, second case, uh, similar. So this is a left eye post traumatic complete third nerve palsy with pupillary involvement, but there is no aberrant regeneration as you can see here. The FDT for LR is tight, and the MR has no force. So we have gone ahead with the uh, maximal. Uh, Uh, LR recession 12 mm with a medial periosteal globe anchoring. Uh, this is a 14 year old male. He has presented with outward deviation of the left eye almost since birth, and uh, on examination there is a moderate ptosis. Everything for LR again it's free, and there is an aberrant regeneration at two places here, MR to LPS we can see here, and also IR to LPS. So he is a case of left eye congenital complete third nerve palsy with pupillary involvement and also with aberrant regeneration. So this is a short video showing his aberrant regeneration here. There is an MR to LPS aberrant regeneration, and there is an aberrant regeneration from IR to LPS as well. So uh, we have. Uh, Uh, use the principle of fixation duress. We have operated on the normal eye here, um, LR and MR, and the exo is corrected as you can see here. So this is an old lady in which in whom we have done uh, lateral rectus periosteal fixation and MR resection of 8 mm. This is a post-op two-month follow-up. There is a slight residual exotropia, but the she is happy with the results. Uh, this is an interesting case. I would. Uh, Like to sum up my presentation after this. Yeah. Uh, this is a case presented by Dr. Pradeep Sharma in 2017, and we have already published this as well. There is a left eye synergistic divergence here. Uh, both LR are uh, contracting simultaneously, and we can see that the IR and LR are contracting simultaneously here. The same evidence is shown in the MRI as well. LR and LR and IR. So we have used this and uh, done LR maximal supra maximal recession with an IR to MR transposition. So here he is. The, this is a pre-op and this is a post-op. The exo is corrected and the synergistic divergence is also corrected. Uh, this is a case of absent MR. Modified nishida has been done. Sum it up, please. Yeah. So thank you.
for yeah. giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for summing it up on right time. Um, uh, thank you for all our speakers for their wonderful presentations, and thank you for this team panel for their time and uh, wise words. And uh, yeah, we'll take our questions uh, outside uh, and over to the next. Uh, I see. Please, please. And just to add one one thing, uh, Dr. Minakshi, you said we missed out the. Uh, the optic nerve head uh, swelling. I think we, when we do refraction, fundus has to be seen for all, but then, yeah, I know, I know. So the thing is that we, our threshold for uh, imaging should be low. low. Uh, but the problem is that in India, people can't afford. That's the problem. Otherwise, in the West, uh, I mean, this would have, people would have lost the job for this. But they can afford it, we can't afford it. So we have to use best of our abilities to find these patients and pick it up, right? Good, good presentation. Thank you, sir. And we go to the next session. I would like to call uh, Dr. Suma Ganesh on the um, dais here, please. Dr. Arub Bhomik and Dr. Kavita, please come.